Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Boz. Welcome to my channel. It uh, is Sunday night, but I am recording this from New Orleans, about to go on stage and give a lecture to uh, the Obstetrics and Gynecology Organization who invited me to teach them about the ketogenic diet. I'm going to use the lecture that uh, they're going to hear as what you get to hear. So I've got a great uh, show for you tonight. Please uh, leave your comments uh, and like this video. I've learned that those things are really helpful for other people to find this video. I am still looking for folks to follow me on Instagram and watch my fasting that happens each week, trying to reach a Dr. Boz ratio of 40 or less. Uh, I also am looking for anybody out there that is starting their own ketogenic uh, support group. I would love to help you figure that out. We are trying to make sure that other people have the opportunity to join in a community of people trying to improve their health one ketone at a time. All right, let's get started with this lecture. This is uh, the uh, the presentation that I put forth to the obstetrics and gynecology department. They uh, wanted to hear about the ketogenic diet, so I thought I would use um, what do I think physicians should know when starting the ketogenic diet or when recommending it to patients. So this might be a little sciencey for some of you, but I think it uh, hopefully will satisfy uh, several of the women who asked me to come give this speech today and that they learn hopefully something <laughs> from this lecture that I'm about to give for them. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to look at the outline that I uh, set forth today, the keto outline. We're going to introduce you to the keto diet, make sure you know what that word autophagy means, and then the areas that I think doctors should know about include heart, brains, and guts. So let's get to it. So for those of you new to the ketogenic diet, your body uses three fuels. And it's been a while since uh, some of us have been to biochemistry, but carbs, protein, and fat are the three fuels that we use to energize our body. I really like us to focus on the carbs and the fat, but let's review what these do. Looking at the fuel sources, I like to use the analogy of a campfire. So a campfire where you're sitting around it trying to stay warm, if you used carbs to heat your body or to fuel your body, you would find that the energy is kind of like a matchstick or some kindling. It lights a really pretty beautiful fire, but it dies down pretty quickly. In the, in the mechanism of fueling our system, we do use carbs before we use fat when, when generating fuel. Uh, the carbohydrate-driven fuel really spikes quickly, only lasts a couple of hours. So in the analogy of a campfire, it doesn't keep you warm for very long. Proteins, actually I don't like using this as a fuel source. It really, proteins are broken down into amino acids and they actually account for a very minimal amount of our fuel. But in the excessive consumption of protein, uh, the fuel will last longer than the carbohydrates, closer to four hours. Uh, it would be an analogy in a campfire, much like uh, fueling a fire with some twigs. So you get a little better burn from uh from the fuel source, but not uh, nearly as powerful as what happens when we fuel our body with fat. So a fat, again, is a, is a little slower to get started. It's one of the last resources our body will use. Um, it will want those carbohydrates burned through before it will tap into our fat storages. But if you are going to keep yourself warm in the middle of the night with a campfire, I would recommend that you burn logs. It can be a little tough to get those logs started, but once they're burning, man, that energy and that warmth is steady. You can now add other logs to the fire and they will recruit that uh, fuel source to keep feeding the fire. And that is how I think of the ketogenic diet. When you get that fat burning, when their metabolism does burn better, boy, nothing beats a good fat burning metabolism. All right, in this process, you're gonna see that I use glucose uh, by uh, the shapes of these little squares. Uh, I wasn't, it wasn't an accident that I used these three facial expressions. When you take in glucose, they do have a good feeling, but excessive amounts of glucose really slow down the way our brain works and our energy. We become addicted to this cycle of bursting in that glucose every couple of hours to keep us, um, to keep us energized and to keep us going. Glucose comes from carbohydrates. So just in case you wondered, well, which carbohydrates are you talking about? I am talking about things like potatoes and ice cream and bran muffins and yogurt and cereal 
and sugar and wine and all these other things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Looking at uh, these different examples <clears throat> of carbohydrates, uh, carbs of many different sorts, whether there is fiber or not fiber, whether they are fruit or not fruit, <clears throat> whether they are fruit or not fruit, they turn into glucose within our system. They get broken down and we use that glucose as fuel. The other major fuel source that goes into our mitochondria are ketones. And ketones come from fat. So very quickly, I'll get asked, well, what does it mean to be on a ketogenic diet? What kinds of things are they eating? And this list of butter and liverwurst and chicken wings and eggs and avocados and cream and bacon, uh, ribs as long as they're dry rubbed and not full of uh, barbecues sugar uh, ribs, those are all good examples of um, uh, of fats that I recommend on the ketogenic diet. You'll notice that lard and tallow and sour cream all made the list, but if you'll take notice of the, that word oils, I've left off not seed oils. So we'll get more to that by the end of this lecture. All right, fat is the optimal fuel for your body. It is uh, filled uh, with um, the best way to fuel the mitochondria. Uh, that's again, when we say fuel or when we say metabolism, what I'm really thinking about is the microscopic little fellas inside most cells called your mitochondria. And when we feed the mitochondria uh, ketones, again, we feed them fat or derivatives of fat, uh, we see that they have a much more sustainable, healthy, less inflamed uh, setting. So fuel your mitochondria with fat. What does that look like? So this is my little drawing of a mitochondria, and you've got this electrical circuit that happens inside our mitochondria. This is where we get our energy. For the physicians, this is where the Krebs cycle will burn and, 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 and push out some ATP uh, for phosphorylating um, those carbons to turn it into energy. So in our fuel options, what can go into a mitochondria isn't protein. We don't, we don't burn protein. We burn carbs or fat. Uh, so if we look at the carbohydrates, they will enter the mitochondria as glucose, and they're phosphorylated, and they burn through there, and they deliver a burst of energy. And that's how we feel better. That's how we feel energy. When it comes to fat, the mitochondria will go into those ketones, uh, well, go into, excuse me, fat goes into the mitochondria as ketones and delivers a much more sustainable energy. As we feed ketones through that mitochondria, you see that burn stronger and stronger. And once that mitochondria gets used to burning those ketones, you'll find that there is a preferential uh, um, access to burn more and more of those ketones. It will almost like prime the pump once that ketone flips from burning glucose to burning ketones. Punchline I'm trying to make here is fat is the optimal source for burning your fuels. All right, so let's get into the other enemy in this system, which is insulin. So I drew insulin to be like this. There's a big eye on his forehead. He's kind of um, ugly looking, and there's a big flame around him. So you can say that I demonized insulin. As much as you can get beaten up for in the social media to demonize insulin, most of my patients and most of the chronic Ill, chronically inflamed patients have way too much insulin. Their insulin does have a fire around it, much like this diagram has, and I found it to be very useful when saying, if we're looking at the core uh, source of what we should be measuring to see if the patient is uh, going to benefit from a ketogenic diet or if they're at risk for these long-term chronic illnesses, insulin is the enemy. So I demonized insulin. Yes, I did. This is what my patients look like when they have lots of excessive insulin in their body. They're inflamed. They're tired. Their joints hurt. This guy doesn't have a very fat tummy, but most of the patients with chronic insulin have a fat tummy. So obesity, arthritis, NASH, diabetes type 1 and type 2, cardiovascular disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, autism, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, vitiligo, allergies, infections, asthma, migraines. I could go on. This is just a list of who are the bread and butter elevated insulin syndromes that I see on a chronic basis or on a regular basis. Again, chronically inflamed system is what we're looking at there.
So when we bring on ketones to the, to the scene, we know that the insulin flame gets less. The ketones provide a different fuel source, and before long, that flame gets less and less, especially if those, consistence, if those ketones are around consistently. We now have a less scary version of insulin who doesn't have a flame around him. We, of course, need insulin to function normally. Uh, type 1 diabetics don't make enough or or any insulin, and they do struggle with longevity and with brains that don't work very well. Uh, in many cases, uh, the physicians today will overuse insulin, and I have, I have done this to my patients. Uh, we, we will use excessive amounts of insulin when they don't make enough. And in many ways, it's because we don't match what their pancreas can do as well as um, by, by using our injections. All right, so the punchline here is we can reverse the flames of insulin as long as ketones are around. Our heroes that make healthy, non-inflamed patients with clear brains are ketones and our hero fat. So the, the other terms I think that are important for the basics of understanding a ketogenic diet, we're going to use the word nutritional ketosis. Nutritional ketosis means that they lower their carbohydrates to the point where the body will start recruiting fat cells to empty and use those fat cells uh, to shuffle them to the liver. The liver will then um, make ketones out of the mitochondria in your liver and you can find ketones in your blood circulation. <clears throat> that is called nutritional ketosis, and uh, we're going to use uh, a couple of the staples within this uh, literature to talk about burning fat by ditching carbs. The art and science of low-carb performance is Dr. Volek and Dr. Finney, both of which I owe a great deal of um, gratitude for what I've learned from their paved ways in the ketogenic science before I got to the scene. Uh, and using some of their, uh, sci this is actually a drawing from their book, um, The Art and Science of Low-Carb Performance. We talk about insulin um, on the y-axis and fat burning on the x-axis. And if you start with 20 carbohydrates, as what uh, most of us recommend, 20 carbohydrates does result in fat burning, uh, that's 20 carbohydrates in a day. Uh, we see some people um, try to use, well, is it 20 carbohydrates with a subtraction of fiber or not? And I would say don't play that game if you're really looking to be in ketosis. 20 grams of carbohydrates per day, period. Don't play the, the fiber game. You'll look at some of the low-carbohydrate diets, and those will usually be diets where there are 30 grams um, of carbs per day. You'll see that they make a little bit more insulin when looking at um, that, um, that this diagram that they draw. They also have quite a lot less uh, uh, fat burning that occurs. So I, I really uh, point this out to patients when they say, can I use, have more than 20 carbs? I still, I still appear to be in ketosis. And I say, well, if what you're doing this for is to burn fat and lose weight, I would push you to the 20 carbohydrates or less per day. If we do get up to those who say, well, I think being at 100 carbs would be okay with me, and I still make ketones when I'm at 100 carbs, I like to point out where the insulin uh, is on the, this trajectory from their, their diagram. And by the time you get up to 150 carbs per day, practically no fat burning occurs. They're burning back to straight glucose again. Uh, those mitochondria aren't making ketones, and they're certainly not burning fat to produce ketones. So this gives that summary of, well, doc, am I in ketosis or not? And this is why I am such a proponent of this diet. It is not a question of, am I in ketosis or not? Uh, you can see what the body is doing by poking their finger and looking at the data. Uh, nothing like an internist to bring this to the table. If I can't measure it, then I have a difficult time uh, plotting the progress and pl plotting their improvement. Um, my patients that I follow for their diets all get this very helpful diagram, uh, excuse me, helpful spreadsheet that allows them to track and put in their uh, daily glucoses and their ketones, and we get to then monitor their, their bodies uh, throughout the progress of their ketogenic uh, journey. Uh, here is the monitor that I recommend. I'm from the tundra and the heat wave of South Dakota, so I have taken the advice of my patients who said, boy, if you look at the strips, 
that don't go bad. And by bad, I mean in the cold weather, they can sometimes get damaged. In super hot cars, they can sometimes get damaged. Uh, you can't say that they would never have a 4 care strip that went bad, but I've been using this monitor now for over two years, and I've had some pretty hot cars that my strips have stayed in, and we've had negative 50 below uh, wind chill for the cars where my strips have still worked the next day, and I will give a hats off that this monitor and the strips have been a, a, uh, just a gift to my patients to not just monitor it in my clinic, but this is a meter where they can take this home. Uh, they, they buy it off the internet. Um, if you use that little promo code, you can get a discount because I believe you cannot help these patients unless they're monitoring their system. It is a big deal. Uh, don't play around if you really want the kind of outcomes that I reach for in my clinic. You must have them monitoring uh, on a routine basis. So the next thing we're going to go to is, well, what are we monitoring? Why are we monitoring? And if you look at the literature behind the ketogenic diet, uh, it stems from the glucose ketone index and what that does for predicting your immune system to be repaired and even uh, seizure thresholds to be reduced, uh, or the threshold is increased, their number of seizures decreased, based on this thing called a glucose to ketone index. In the last few years, you'll also see this glucose to ketone index as part of the press pulse uh, 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 protocol that's used in cancer treatment. Dr. Thomas Seafried is probably the most um, cited and uh, well researched for this index, and I used his textbook to uh, study it and teach uh, some of my most um, most uh, tender patients. So it is uh, shortened to the terms GKI, glucose ketone index. And when you look at the literature, they're taking the glucose and they're divided uh, and they're um, reducing it um, or comparing it to ketones. Uh, we're going to use this uh, to show you a little bit why it's so important to teach this uh, uh, in a careful step-by-step -step way. So when I was trying to convince my mom who had uh, cancer that we were going to try and get her glucose to ketone index improved, the first thing we said was, yeah, mom, when you poke your finger, your, your device is set for the American uh, uh, units. So you're going to get milligrams per, per deciliter that come out of your little meter. I need you to convert that to the rest of the world, or almost the rest of the world, where they use millimoles per liter. So they had to take their glucose and divide by 18. The next thing they did is they have to reduce uh, the ketone to a 1.0. So if they had a glucose uh, or a ketone that was 1.2, they had to reduce it to a 1. So let's take these three examples down there below. So if they got a, a glucose of 5.3 uh, and a ketone of 1.2, they would need to reduce that to a 4.5 to 1. So that would be a, a GKI of 4.5. The next example there is their glucose was 55, their ketones were 1.5. And so you reduce that 1.5 to a 1 and you get a 3.7. Now the last one there, he had a ketone that was below 1, so he had to in increase it actually. So his glucose was 4.1 and glucose 0.9. By getting that glucose to a 1.0, now he has a GKI of 4.6. All right, my mother said, oh my goodness, that's incredibly complicated. Uh, the purpose of doing this, though, was to reach for a word called autophagy. And if you don't know what that word is, um, I'll break it down with a little Latin saying phagy is to eat and auto is, to, is thyself. So uh, autophagy is the term we use that says eat thyself. And in 2015, uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine went to uh, the man studying autophagy that says we can calculate this and it really has everything to do with insulin and those blood glucoses and blood ketones. So this glucose to ketone index became a powerful uh, studying tool to say, well, are we using, are we, are we reaching autophagy? And although we can't measure this on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, we know that the overall insulin present in somebody's body was, would shut off their autophagy. So you say, well, doc, why do I want to eat myself? That sounds terrible. Uh, autophagy actually is this cellular process that says when a, when a cell isn't being used or when it's being used in a way that um, is very inflamed or it's got some defects in it, 
those are the kind of cells that we want to wipe off the plate. We can do that by igniting autophagy. So when we look at cellular debris, specifically in a disease like, say, Alzheimer's, there's lots of debris found, found around their brain. To improve their brain outcome, we want the autophagy to be activated, which will kind of sweep up some of that debris found in a brain. So autophagy was linked to a higher, uh, better level of functioning the more times you could touch that in your lifetime. So when I look at um, a glucose ketone index, uh, we want a four to one, might get you into autophagy, but it is a place where we could say pretty solid chance of weight loss. Two to one said you get a pretty solid chance of autophagy, and there we know that your immune system is probably improving. And finally, a one to one is the best chance of autophagy, and that's what I would uh, reach for when my patients were struggling with cancer or were having um, uh, using the ketogenic diet to help with their seizures. So um, if you're feeling overwhelmed at this point, I'll tell you that makes you normal. <laughs> because the person who scolded me so badly was my own mother who said, I don't know what you think I am, but I am not capable of doing all of that math. <laughs> and this is a picture of my dear mom. Uh, this is when she was about 70 years old. That's my son, and he is giving her a kiss on one of the days where she was going in for chemo. It was her third round of chemo, and uh, she just uh, had been suffering from chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, and or chronic lymphocytic uh, lymphoma and had quite um, a struggle and I became an expert in the ketogenic diet the day she said honey um, I, they want chemo again and I'm not going to do that again uh, and my mom at 71 said there's got to be something else or I'm, I'm just not going to live my life this way uh, that's when I embraced the ketogenic diet and started teaching her one little lesson at a time how to uh, perfect and master this very sciencey diet uh, in a way that wasn't just playing but was actually trying to get her to have the best metabolism possible. Uh, so the first thing we did is we had to take out a lot of that math because she was too sick. Uh, her brain was not working well. So we took that glucose to ketone index and we, we made something called the Dr. Boz ratio. And that Dr. Boz ratio uh, just does many similar things. First of all, it, we take the glucose and we don't flip uh, the them into the other millimoles. We just take the number that comes right out of the machine and we divide it by ketones. Again, the number that comes right out of the machine. And if we got that number to be 80 or less, we knew that she'd lose weight and she might get to autophagy. Um, but if we got her to 40, we knew that her immune system would have, would have a chance of repairing. Um, but in her case, we were treating cancer. So we were trying to get to a Dr. Boz ratio of 20 or less. And again, this all comes from that GKI. Uh, we are really trying to reduce insulin. That's the whole point of measuring this. That's what this is about, is the ketogenic diet has some really good evidence, but you do need to measure. So let's just drive this home a little bit. So Grandma Rose would check her sugars, and they would be 97. And uh, then the ketones would be 1.2. Uh, when you look at a GKI, there you have the conversion rate. But a Dr. Boz ratio would lead her to 80. Uh, that would put her in the weight loss zone. We would then say, well, if her glucose was 100 and her ketones were 1.5, we now we're down to a Dr. Boz ratio of 66. Again, not quite where we'd want her to be for immune system or cancer, but weight loss is pretty likely then. Here, if your gl glucose was down to 75, but you only made ketones at 0 0.9, you could still get pretty close to weight loss, weight loss at that point. Um, but now we look at things like, oh, if your glucose was 88 and your ketones were 1.1, that would get you to a Dr. Boz ratio of 80. Again, very likely to have weight loss, but not immune repair and not chemo. Here was an example where their blood sugar was 77 and their ketones were 2.1 and that got to a Dr. Boz ratio of 36. This is what I try to reach every week when I do my fasting is to get that Dr. Boz ratio less than 40. I want to enhance my immune system and try to prevent any cancer that's trying to grow in me. Um, finally, this is where we would take Grandma Rose is we would get her sugars down into those 60s. We would want her ketones to be in that 2 to 3 point range. Uh, because that would get her Dr. Boz ratio down to 20. This is very difficult to do. Uh, it took a lot of guidance to get there. But I will tell you, the point 
of doing all this is insulin. We want the insulin to be less because insulin, when you realize what it does, it is a growth hormone. So here's an example of an image from an old textbook. And those two masses on his abdomen are because he's been injecting insulin into his tummy. He's a type 1 diabetic. And he would inject day after day. This is about six years into injecting that insulin in the same two spots in his tummy um, because he's a type 1 diabetic. And you'll notice that it put fat inside all those fat cells, but it also was a growth hormone. It grew fat cells in those areas where the insulin would the insulin would bathe the area that it would uh, impact. Now the insulin will go throughout the body, but the areas where it was excessive, you can see right there that he's got a pretty lean uh, muscle mass everywhere else. But that excessive amounts of insulin. This is that short-acting insulin when it first came out in the. Uh, in the early part of last century, uh, this is what the textbooks would show if they would inject the insulin in the exact same spots. This is another example where the patient injected the insulin into the upper thigh. And again, the rest of his body was lean, but those areas where he injected insulin over and over and over again showed the excessive growth hormone as well as the excessive size of those fat cells when you look at them under a microscope. Take a take a uh, look at most of your patients, my patients with high insulin syndromes, and they don't just have those two spots where the body has overgrown. They have um, their whole system has high amounts of fat storage and excessive amounts of cellular development from the growth part of that growth hormone. All right. So we are past the introduction to the ketogenic diet. We have done the autophagy. Let's get to the heart of the matter uh, by looking at heart, brains, and guts. So these are the three areas that I think doctors should know about when you look at the ketogenic diet. We're going to first start with hearts because when I get phone calls or emails from physicians, they want to talk about, hey, why uh, isn't this bad for their heart? What's their cholesterol doing? And I remind them that if you want to protect people from a heart attack, which is why they're asking about heart uh, cholesterol. It's why they're wanting to know what do you do with this cholesterol. I ask them to go to a couple studies that I like to point out when if you want to predict somebody's heart attack, don't just look at the cholesterol. Look at this evil, excessive amount of insulin. So insulin is what causes heart disease, and we can show you that by uh, looking at one of the studies that studied all men, so that is a downside uh, in that there's no women in it, but it was 22 years of study. It's not a short study, it's long. It's called the Helsinki Policeman Study, and it did have 22 years of follow-up and then some. And what they were able to say is that the, ri the risk of major coronary heart disease events, which was death or non-fatal MI, was associated with high levels of uh, insulin in men without diabetes. Again, the study came out in 1998 and since then has been continued to look at these men over time. Uh, the, the conclusions are still solid in that insulin was the biggest predictor of this heart disease. Let's just look carefully at that study uh, uh, to say the proportion of folks with uh, heart diseases along your y-axis or x-axis X -axis was the years. And if you look, the, the lowest quintile, we divided these out into five different um, uh, sections. And when you look at the lowest folks who had heart disease versus those that with the highest amount of heart disease, the biggest separation uh, of findings were what was their insulin. Again, these were patients who did not have diabetes. They had high levels of insulin. Um, the, the lower their insulin, the lower their chances of heart, heart attacks um, um, or, uh, or fatal heart attacks or non-fatal heart, atta heart disease. Uh, looking at that study, though, uh, when looking at LDL cholesterol, when looking at even blood pressure, um, blood pressure was a better predictor, but it was nothing as uh, correlative as the level of insulin uh, predicting whether or not the patient would have a heart attack. So keeping that as our punchline of what do we call it when people have high insulin uh, but they don't have uh, diabetes, their sugars are still well controlled, uh, we call it metabolic syndrome. So if you look at metabolic syndrome, uh, what we should be calling it is years of hidden elevated insulin. And this is what my patients look like because that insulin is excessive and inflammatory throughout their system. So metabolic syndrome has rules. 
and we have five of those rules. So for starters, uh, it's associated with obesity, it's associated with glucose, and the um, they you can measure this by looking at their waistline, you can look at their blood pressure, you look at their fasting blood sugar, their triglycerides, and then their good cholesterol. Keeping in mind that the waist circumference for women and men are about five inches different, the otherwise the blood pressures were the same for men and women, fasting blood sugars should be less than 100 folks, and when they are above 100, Bam, that increases, that says you have high insulin. If I look back at the people that I have buried uh, before I was using the ketogenic diet to help them, um, I look to see they had high triglycerides and those morning fasting sugars were up. They had blood pressures that were not 130 or 85 or less. Um, their HDL cholesterol was low. This is metabolic syndrome. It is what kills. Do not be deceived that the cholesterol is the most important thing to check. Instead, it is the insulin that is the most important thing to check. So you say, well, how do you check that? <laughs> uh, actually, we're going to uh, let me show you this one more thing. So this is all cause mortality versus cardiovascular mortality. Again, looking back at that same time when they were looking to say, how can we predict who dies of a heart attack? Um, these are people without metabolic syndrome, meaning their, their insulins were low. Uh, and they really did have a, you know, 2% mortality rate over the course of these 20 years. But as soon as you added that metabolic syndrome, that high insulin, you had a 12% that died of heart attacks, and you had nearly an, a 17% that died from all-cause mortality. This a very powerful predictor of where should we be focused, and it is not the LDL cholesterol that we should be looking at. Instead, it is the insulin. Insulin wins. So how do you measure somebody's insulin? Yes, you can spend 70 bucks and send them to the, um, you can send them to the um, lab and get that checked. But I'll tell you, insulin is very volatile. It goes up and down. There's lots of things that change it. I tease my patients that uh, when they come into the lab, if they happen to take a, a big bowel movement before they do their insulin, it's going to throw it up. It's going to shoot it up. So don't do that. But insulin is very volatile. So it's not actually the best thing to check when you're only going to look once. You can get an idea of insulin if you're going to look at it before they eat and after a bunch of sugar and two hours later and four hours later. Boy, that's a couple thousand dollars of a test. Instead, a much better way to look at this is the Dr. Boz ratio. Again, looking at glucose, looking at ketones, getting that Dr. Boz ratio under 150, very big moment for my patients, getting it under 100, even better. And of course, that 80, 40, and 20 uh, has the evidence for the glucose ketone index for those other parameters. All right, that's my summary on hearts, uh, which is pay attention to your Dr. Boz ratio. Let's move on to my favorite organ to study, which is brains. All right, this is what most of my patients look like when they come to see me. They come to my clinic because their brain isn't working right. And the reason I was studying the ketogenic diet in the first place was to look at the fascination in brain repair after an injury, whether the injury was from um, Parkinson's or concussion or addiction, I was uh, fascinated by how quickly they were repairing brains uh, when they fueled the brain with a different fuel. So what does, what fuel does our brain use? And uh, if you look back at the textbooks from uh, when I was in medical school, it taught us that brains use glucose. Um, I will tell you that um, brains do use glucose, but when they are fueled uh, with only glucose for years and years and years, we end up with some problems. Uh, these are a list of some of the problems that I take care of in my clinic and that have been uh, successful in how we address that, uh, that foggy brain, if you would. Um, but when I look at the brain fuels that are possible, we now know that glucose and ketones can be used by the human brain. So the next question that these folks in 2016 were looking at is, well, if brains can use ketones, how quickly can we get that brain to switch from glucose to ketones? So uh, they did a study. And that study came out in 2016. I didn't see it until this past year where they took 10 healthy adults and they were ages 20 to 50. They were on the standard American diet and they studied their brains through PET scans. 
The PET scans were watching to see what happened when we switched their brain from glucose to ketones, and they thought it would probably take about a month to really get that brain up and using ketones effectively. So here's a picture of a PET scan, and we use the PET scans to uh, look at different levels of activity. That brain activity is going to be linked to the substance we're studying, so the colors represent what level of brain activity is linked to the substance that we're looking at. So let's make that a little more clear by saying, if you look at this measuring units, uh, this measuring tool and the units with it, this is this, the measuring unit for glucose. So uh, when we have a blue, it was very little activity was using glucose. When it was mild, it was, uh, when it, excuse me, it was green, it was mild activity for using glucose. When it was yellow, it was moderate brain activity. And when it was red, it was high activity for their brain. As we looked at their brains, we first tagged glucose to measure how much of their brain was being fueled by glucose. Again, we infused that into their system, and then we did a scan of their brain. Then we said, well, now let's tag ketones and see if any of their brain is using ketones. So we, again, put that in there and did another PET scan looking at their brains for ketones. So the first scans were done on a standard American diet. The second scan was done after four days of a very high fat ketogenic diet. In fact, if I had to analyze this diet, I would say it's very close to the, the, the diet that I would call a paleolithic ketogenic diet. We'll get to that in a minute. Or the kind of diet that I would use as a prescription strength ketogenic diet for my seizure patients or those people using a ketogenic diet to help with their cancer treatment. So, what were the results? Okay, brain activity fueled by glucose for first day. Again, this is the glucose monitor or the glucose meter, so you'll see a zero is kind of black and 36 uh, is the highest it goes and it's red. So on day one, this is what their brains look like. Day one, you will see that 98% of their brain was fueled by glucose. There is a bunch of red in there. There's a bunch of yellow. And again, that's how most of our brains are functioning. Uh, if you look, there's very little space where there's a low amount of glucose being taken up by the brain. By day four of the high-fat ketogenic diet, I want you to watch carefully as I push the button to see what happened by day four of this high-fat ketogenic diet. Keep in mind, we thought this was going to take several weeks to get those mitochondria in the brain using ketones. Wow, look at that. The amount of activity in their brain that was mild to moderate amounts of glucose was in four days. Like, well, what would their brain be doing if it wasn't using glucose anymore? So let's show you what happened with ketones. Here, we tagged ketones like we did the glucose. And again, the higher the intensity of use, the more red and yellow you'll see. Blue says practically no ketones are being used. So on day one, here's the measuring unit for ketones, which is different than the measuring unit for glucose, but almost zero brain activity was fueled by ketones on day one for these people eating the standard American diet. By day four this of this high-fat ketogenic diet, you can see an intense amount of areas that have suddenly started using ketones within four days. That is a powerful teaching moment for me as a physician to say, well, if we can just get ketones into the brain, maybe we can see some of these other things improve before um, I teach them all about how to change their diet. So glucose versus ketones. Here is day one. Top one is glucose, the bottom one is ketones. And just to drive home this point, here is what happened at day four. The reduction of use of glucose and the incredible increase in the use of ketones on day four. This was a game changer in my clinic when I saw this. Our brain is fueled by glucose and by ketones, uh, but let's take a look at the brains that are the hardest for me to take care of. Um, in those patients, I talk about something called the brain gap. Brain gap means um, the when we look at the ketogenic medium chain triglycerides, we can increase the brain energy metabolism in my most difficult patients, and those would be Alzheimer's disease. 
Alzheimer's disease, boy, if you want to see a way to in ignite prevention, I would have you come look at the folks in my clinic that struggle with Alzheimer's. This will uh, make you very interested in wanting to know much more about medium chain triglycerides. So for those newbies in the audience, I'll just remind you, medium chain triglycerides are chains of fat, and they are like Goldilocks. They're not the small ones. They're not the large ones. They are medium, and that means they are 8 to 10 carbons in length. So I've circled them here, and specifically, I want you to remember the, the, the code of C8, C10. That is what your labels should say on the back are in the supplements of medium chain triglycerides. You'll get some uh, of the cheaper supplements out there that use C12, and by golly, they are not uh, the beneficial triglyceride. The reason we want C8 and C10 is that these two fat chains do not need digested. They, they can be absorbed, go directly into that portal vein, that portal vein dumps them into the liver, and the liver churns them through the mitochondria in the cells of your liver, and you have ketones within circulation about 20 to 30 minutes after you take in fats 8 or 10 carbons long. All right, so that's a quick summary of uh, medium chain triglycerides. Let's look at the data. The ketogenic med medium chain triglycerides increase brain energy metabolism in Alzheimer's disease. And here's what the studies show. If you look at this, uh, this brain energy thing, okay, brain energy, what I want you to remember is 88. If you have 88% of the brain cells functioning, they couldn't measure uh, a brain uh, that wasn't functioning right. Meaning if 88% of the brain cells were being fueled and were, had plenty of energy, we couldn't me measure any memory problems. It doesn't mean their brains were perfect. It just means uh, they didn't have any outward symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So let's, uh, let's look at this study and see who, what we're looking at. We're going to study what was the brain using for glucose, how much of the brain was using ketones, and was there any energy gap? The types of people that we looked at in this study were those that were young, healthy people. That's you and I in the room. They were older folks who did not have a memory problem. And then there were the mild memory problems. And I'll tell you, with our baby boomers in the age they're at, this was not hard to find people with mild memory problems. They still lived in their homes. They still drive cars. But when it comes to measuring their memory, they were right on the edge. They had just a few symptoms. And I would contend that their... Um, their, their energy gap was right there on the edge of 88% of their brain was being fueled, while about that 12% of their brain was just screaming, saying, hey, can you give me some fuel? Can you give me some energy? Let's take a look at how this turned out. The young healthy group had perfect energy. It had 100%, 95% glucose, 5% of their brain ran on ketones, and they had zero energy gap. They were perfect. They had no problems. We move on to the older with no memory problems, and you can see that their glucose was above the 88%. It was actually at 89. They got three extra points for the, key, the part of their brain that used ketones, but they still had an 8% energy gap that was present in their brains. The mild memory problems were those people who were, again, right at 88%. Their brains had memory problems. They did not per, uh, perform perfectly on the memory test that we gave them. They didn't have enough diagnostic criteria to be called Alzheimer's. They were just called mild cognitive impairment, MCI. And again, this is, a, this is a scary place to be because to me, in my clinic, this was that point where they were just on the edge of the point of no return. So they had 85% of their brain fueled by glucose, 3% uh, by ketones, leaving a 12% deficit. Now what happened when we added MCT, medium chain triglycerides, specifically the C8, C10? That would be not digested but absorbed into their body and circulating ketones throughout their, uh, throughout their system. We found that they had 84% of their glucose, again, not much change from the other markers, uh, from their, their counterparts, but we were able to increase their ketone uh, uh, fuel in their brain by 4%. This pushed them above that 88%, now functioning as if they had no memory problems, uh, still had a 9% deficit overall, but 
I'll take it. That 91% means they do not have measurable symptoms of Alzheimer's that I can get in my clinic. Uh, finally, if we had 45 grams of that MCT, even more. The glucose doesn't change at all, but now we had 10% of their brain burning ketones using that as their fuel. We only had a 6% deficit, which was actually better than the folks that were in the first, uh, that second column there. And how did they do it? They did it because their brain gap was only 6% and they had increased the amount of their brain using ketones, which improved their cognitive performance. So what does this have all to do? By the way, that data came out in 2018. So again, just recently around the corner, but I will tell you it was another game changer for my patients that are struggling. We know that brains prefer ketones over glucose, but you've got to get that key, those uh, ketones in circulation in order for the uh, patients to take advantage of it. So this was, uh, again, one of those places where I wrote a book teaching my mom about ketones and glucose, but I have had some uh, very humble, humble pie pieces come to me as far as brain performance and what ketones have to offer. I will say that as my patients who have tremors and concentration and anger issues and irritable moods and depression and brain injuries, uh, when they struggle with a brain that's not working right, I've learned start with um, not hanging out in that, in that fog of only using glucose to fuel their brain. Boost their brain by adding ketones. And I would say that you don't have to start with the diet in these patients. They are, uh, they are going to be overwhelmed if they would sit through this lecture. They would probably yell at me just like my mom did at first saying, this is too much. I can't handle this. Tell me how to do this without, without getting so overwhelmed by all that sciencey stuff. And what I uh, would tell my mom and what I would tell my patients is that it is right to feel overwhelmed. That's the job of us, the medical professionals, to take in the information and say, how do we boil it down? What's the first step that I have my Alzheimer's patients or even my depressed patients do now? And that is uh, the same thing I would have done with my mom had she had uh, uh, this story today. Uh, she is now alive and doing well, chemo-free and cancer-free, uh, but her brain was not doing well. Um, her glucose to ketone index ratio, we wanted under 40 and really under 20 uh, to help her feel better. Uh, that isn't easy to get to, especially if they can't concentrate very well. So how would I have my uh, memory patients uh, deal with this now? I would use the supplements. I would pour ketones into their circulation for at least the first month and watch to see what happens. Ketones were made in the 1960s or 70s. They used to be really expensive. We now can use them in supplements. I find that lots of supplements have things in there I don't want my patients taking, but as long as those medium chain triglycerides are C8 and C10 and the ketones that are in the powder or capsule form have very few other ingredients, um, I tell them to pour the ketones in. Let's watch your brain wake up and then we're going to teach you how to live with 20 carbs or less per day. All right. So, well, what's my Dr. Boz ratio? Uh, again, remember the best part about this diet is that you can measure it. Please don't guess. If you're looking to repair people's brains, if you're looking to improve their metabolism, work to get their ratios to the part where you have evidence behind what you're doing. All right, we're going to get to the final part of this lecture, which sends a wild hair up uh, my, the back of my neck when people say, hey, doc, hey, doc, I have something called leaky gut. I'm like, you have what? You have leaky gut? There is no diagnosis called leaky gut. But man, you would never know that by looking at the literature or looking at the internet. Leaky gut, the correct worm for, term for this, is actually called intestinal permeability diseases. And by permeability, I mean your intestine should not be permeated by things like sodium or bacteria or food particles. It should be a barrier. And when the barrier is broken, we call this intestinal permeability diseases. Uh, there have been a ton of people with leaky gut syndrome saying, hey, this is the cause of it. This is the effect of it. Um, I will tell you, I have looked into this in many ways, and uh, it is not easy to actually restore the permeability barrier. Uh, so making that intestinal impermeable is not easy to restore once they have proven intestinal permeability disease, which if you want to call leaky gut, okay, you're on your own. But I call it intestinal permeability disease because that actually means something. Um, what's going on with these folks is they have defective tight junctions. Yeah, I don't, I'm going to geek out just a little bit. They have 
elevated pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines, specifically TNF-alpha and specifically that INL-13, which is highly expressed in my folks with chronic inflamed intestines. Uh, what happens to them is they will start shedding cells from the insides of their gut and they will have little bitty micro erosions called ulcers. This is a loss of barrier and they are really sick people. They are some of the sickest people in my clinic. Uh, when I look at leaky gut, um, I use this list to say what do we have associated with these intestinal permeability diseases and they are obesity related, specifically when they have NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. When we have have type 1 or type 2 uh, diabetes, when we have uh, cardiovascular heart disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, you'll see lots of autoimmune problems here. You'll see lots of mitochondrial diseases like lupus or multiple sclerosis or autism uh, linked to mitochondria that aren't working right. Um, I, the list is much longer, but I like to point these out for those who say, could this be linked to my leaky gut? And I'm saying, we know that it's linked to your leaky gut especially if you're talking about intestinal permeability defects. The problem is, is that we have yet to be able to say, does anything restore the barrier of the intestines once it's gone bad? And I like to point out in this study where they said, yes, we have looked into this, we have studied permeability, and we know that a compromised intestinal barrier function is associated with an array of clinical conditions, both intestinal and systemic, meaning, yes, this has to do with your gut, but it also has to do with your brain and your heart and your, your uh, endocrine system. We also know that these folks use this word leaky gut syndrome, um, and the correlation between the intestinal permeability, meaning the leakiness of the gut and disease, has caught the attention of the public and is leading to a rise in popularity of pe people using the term leaky gut syndrome, which encompasses a range of symptoms. It's not just a leaky gut that, that we should be focused on. There's much more going on here. Here's the problem. Although we have drugs that target uh, and try to mediate the barrier restoration. They try to seal that gut back up. Uh, none of these drugs that I can prescribe have been, have proven to be effective. All right, so here's the silly word, leaky gut. I'm going to replace it with intestinal permeability. I'm going to point out two of the toughest places, two of the sickest places are folks with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. All right, attempts to modulate the intestinal permeability. All right, we have a lot of things that we've tried to do. We've tried probiotics. We've tried prebiotics. We've tried giving these patients colostrum, which is, again, breast milk from the first few days the mom is breastfeeding. We've tried taking somebody's poop and putting it into another person called fecal transplants. That is a fun one to talk about. There's something called a FODMAP diet, and we've talked about the paleo diet. Keeping in mind, this is not PKD. And you're going to know what that means here in just a second. The problem with all of these attempts to modulate the intestinal permeability, they have all failed when it comes to actual evidence of improving the intestinal permeability. We know that, especially the, the paleo diet, the one that is not quite a, a low carb or a ketogenic, or it's a low carb, but it's not quite a ketogenic diet. They have done a lot of studies and there have been some associated improvements in how the patients feel. However, when measuring their intestinal permeability, zero, did not improve their intestinal permeability until now. And I want you to carefully read this title. It says Crohn's disease successfully treated with the paleolithic ketogenic diet. And I am going to give a big hats off to Sophia Clemens, who has been my teacher from across the globe. She is uh, out of Poland and has just an incredible uh, wealth of knowledge. And we're going to use some of her data today as a way I want to make sure to give full attributions for her clinic and what she's doing to give evidence that the worst of the worst patients, the sickest ones in my clinic, have been improved when they follow a paleolithic ketogenic diet. All right, we're going to go through these words here. Pa paleolithic ketogenic diet is not a keto, is not a paleo diet. It is a paleolithic ketogenic diet. All right, so that stands for PKD. PKD um, is, is ketogenic, meaning they are having high ketones. You could measure their Dr. Boz ratio. They'd probably all be 40 or less in their numbers. And it's also paleolithic, meaning there is no or very limited vegetables. There are no fruits. There are no vegetable oils. 
There are no seed oils, and more importantly, no supplements, no vitamins, no herbs, no, um, it, do, it does not actually, this is not talking about ketone supplements, it's just saying there are no extra supplements of vitamins or anything else going into that gut. Only what was going in are the paleolithic things of uh, vegetable oils, fruits, um, no vegetable oils, no seed oils, uh, no fruits, no vegetables, and no supplements. The studies you're about to see did not use ketones in a can or ketones supplements either. They simply used a paleolithic ketogenic diet. Okay, so that I'm about to give <laughs> this lecture to the uh, obstetrics and gynecology. The only thing I can uh, tell you about your audience of moms is we do have pictures of babies born to moms on the paleolithic ketogenic diet. So stay tuned. This is who I'm trying to help saying, mm, uh, remember, this is not a paleo diet. It's a PKD. All right, before I lose my audience, I'm going to go back to histology. This is the study of cells. This is supposed to be the uh, cell lining of your gut. So that part on the top that's white is you uh, seeing, that's where the food goes. That's uh, where our food comes in one end, goes out the other. That little blue area is supposed to be the slime layer that we all have protecting our body. Uh, and then the rest of these are uh, the cells of enterocytes. We have panis cells that make digestive enzymes. We have goblet cells that make the mucus or the slime layer. We have the nerves that keep track of how things are moving along, and they're called dendritic cells. And more importantly, we have this thing called the lamina propria, which is where our defense system hangs out. These are plasma cells. We also have extra plasma cells that God put in between these cells called intraepithelial plasma cells. Again, we are trying to protect from anybody trying to come to the inside of the body, uh, from the outside of the body, as uh, foreign objects come in when they shouldn't. And then the final little layer that God added to every one of these are the staples. And I mean tight junctions. See these little staples at the top of each cell? These are the final defense layer that says we are not going to let anything into this. We are not going to let impermeability, we are having impermeability, nothing permeates these junctions because we have tight junctions followed by plasma cells, followed by a lamina propria. Uh, we have layers to protect us from anything getting in that shouldn't. So the problem is when we have intestinal permeability, there are four phases. So watch what happens when I push this clicker and we go from, we, we, and phase one shows up. Ready? Here we go. Notice that these spaces between the cells are now microscopic at best, but they are there. And unfortunately, what happens when these microscopic layers are there is uh, these um, tight junctions get stressed. They get stretched out a little, and now they let through some small little salts or sodium solutes. It's super tiny. It's not a big deal. We sure as heck can't measure it with an x-ray or a CAT scan or even an ultrasound or a colonoscopy. We can't see it happening. It's super tiny, but it is there, rest assured. And those salt solutes are the only thing that gets through at first. But then comes phase two, and phase two has even more space between these cells. Now the cellular separation becomes a little more visible, again, not by the naked eye, but we can see it on a microscopic level. Our stretch of our staples are now just barely holding on to either edge, and unfortunately, they're starting to let in foreign particles. These are little particles of food or foreign objects that come in. And once they're there, uh, they can actually go both ways, but more importantly, they got past our intraepithelial plasma cell, and now that little fella will trigger a plasma cell to come over. The plasma cell will then activate. It switches from a kind of dormant phase to one that is producing some things called cytokines. And the cytokine that comes out when food particles come in is we can measure that the interleukin-13 is higher. You might remember that I mentioned that earlier as one of the bad boys. Interleukin-13 is a cytokine, and it comes from activated pl uh, plasma cells in many areas, but specifically when food particles get into your lamina propria, your interleukin-13 will now modulate cell death. death. It's supposed to modulate tumor cell growth. It also is supposed to help you watch for new cancer cells, like it monitors for new cancer antibodies and the potent mediator of fibrosis. 
So when interleukin-13 is a little bit, we can see that it's going to kill off the bad cells, it's going to watch for a few more cancer cells, but uh, the longer that's around, it turns our beautiful soft lamina propria into something that's very fibrous. That is not good for your guts. Uh, the extracellular matrix is also another key regulator uh, of, of interleukin-13. All right, so let's go back. We're at phase three, and now uh, phase three has even wider uh, um, separations between these cells. And we look at those staples, and there is some that don't fit anymore and others that really don't do a good job. Um, but more importantly, we have things like macromolecules, we have food particles and antigens, and we have bacteria now that can slip through those cell cells, get into the inside of the, our lamina propria, and then activate um, our, uh, our plasma cells. The other thing that's happening is we see things start to leak out, like we lose a lot of vitamins and a lot of, of magnesium and other solutes that are going out during phase three. So sometimes we can't notice what's going on at a cellular level, but we can start to see that the body is depleted of things like iron and vitamin D when the gut is leaking. Once that activated plasma cell happens from these types of antigens, we get tumor necrosis factor alpha present. Again, this cytokine is one of the bad boys. It is one of those that does a really gnarly job when in excess. So in little amounts, the TNF alpha does the regulation of your immune system. It's what causes you to have a fever. It is what signals us to use protein in the muscles as food sources if we need them. It is linked to a bunch of inflammation. It is also what's supposed to stop tumors from generating. It's supposed to cause, uh, cause or initiate that programmed cell death. But that's what happens in tiny doses of TNF-alpha. If there's a dysregulation of TNF-alpha, we know that it's linked to Alzheimer's disease, to cancer, to major depression, to psoriasis, to inflammatory bowel disease. These are just a few, but they are signs of some of my sickest, most difficult patients to take care of. So phase four, here we go. What happens in phase four is those little staples, they are goners. They start to fall off and they disappear. Now the, the staple guns at the top of the cell are gone and unfortunately uh, the cytokines start coming out in masses because those plasma cells, there's an army of them turning on, making cytokines. And before you know it, we've got cells disappearing. They're, they're cause causing programmed cell death of our lining. The panis cells disappear. Some of the goblet cells disappear. Other intraepithelial cells disappear. And what we end up with is exposure, uh, just a raw exposure of the lamina propria. The population of these excessive cytokines become something we can see abundance uh, uh, showing up of once you start to have ulcers in that area. Um, and that is what this is called. When we have the removal or the destruction of those uh, enterocytes, we now have a barrier that just spews out not just nutrients like vitamins and minerals and proteins, but also that it allows a whole host of things to come into that body that should not be there. Again, these are super sick patients, and we don't need to wait for them to get super sick for us to check what's going on. We actually have some tests that say if you swallow down a probe that's very specially designed, it will go through your stomach, it will enter into that small intestine, and it will test to see if any of those cells have a leaking that's happening uh, at a cellular level. Uh, what's supposed to happen is all of that probe is supposed to come out your bottom. None of it, zero, should be found in your kidney. And that would be the sign of a very nice, impermeable gut, one that does not leak. Uh, however, when guts are diseased, when they have inflammation, when they are not healthy, we send this probe down, we send it through all the tests, and unfortunately, it gets picked up by the system and we can measure it in their urine. Now, we have different probes for different parts of the gut, like we can test just specifically, is it your stomach that's leaking? Is it your small intestine that's leaking? Is it your large intestine that's leaking? But there's a very special one called polyethylene glycol 400 that measures the whole intestine. It allows us to say, hey, when if this gets in, somewhere along the line, we can test from beginning to end what's leaking. 
Some disadvantages of this one are that we do need to know what your kidney function is before we start. Uh, that helps us with the calculation, um, but uh, it is um, pretty impressive how functional this actual this test is. This is the one that Sophia Clemens uses in her clinic. Um, again, this mixture is water soluble. There's about 10 different particles that we're measuring because different sections of the gut absorb different parts of the uh, molecule. Um, we do collect the uh, urine for six hours afterwards, and then we measure what percentage of this polyethylene glycol is excreted over those six hours. Now, for you physicians in the crowd, polyethylene glycol 400 is not polyethylene glycol 4000. Uh, polyethylene glycol 4000 is the substance that we use to prepare your bowel for a colonoscopy. So it is not absorbable. It goes one in one end, out the other, and never, even in a leaky gut, should you find anything of polyethylene glycol 4000 in the circulation. Uh, this is different. Polyethylene glycol 400 are 11 specific molecules, each of those molecules testing a different section of the gut. Again, it's not toxic. It does not get degraded by the intestinal bacteria. Um, it's not metabolized by the tissue. And you can actually do this at home if you're really strict about the rules. Um, so quite a perfect compound to check for leaky gut syndrome. All right, so here's an example of a patient. We would want all of those 11 compounds at the bottom uh, to turn out to be under that dotted line. That would be a place where it is considered normal. There is hardly any separation of those intraepithelial cells. That intestinal permeability is uh, not present. So in the first uh, one there, we would say the one that weighs 198 uh, units of measurement. Uh, I don't remember what weight the proteins are measured in, but you can see that one measured at about 15%, that little red dot there. Number two was above the threshold, so there was a leaky gut in the section that number two would study. Uh, number three, number four, number five, you can see it plot out saying when we see this measurement go above that threshold, we now can deduce that those sections of the gut were leaking. They, they allowed a molecule in that was not supposed to get in. And again, we can't see this through biopsy. We can't see this through, um, um, you know, it's, it will be a problem that we see far later in the disease state. We can measure the disease state with a, a probe such as polyethylene glycol 400 at a much earlier disease state. But more importantly, we can measure to see if it returns to normal when we treat patients. So, a paleo diet, this is an example of one who says, yeah, I take about 300 grams of nuts per day. They have a leaky gut and they said, yes, I think I feel better now that I'm on the paleo diet. But if you'll see their polyethylene glycol 400 showed eh, not quite what we wanted. That was above the threshold uh, for what uh, would be considered normal. Their gut is still leaking. Now that was not a PKD, that was a paleo diet. So let's take a look at these two. Uh, the, blue, the red line was done first uh, on this Paleolithic diet. Again, those are the people who come in and say, yep, I eat about you know, 30 carbs per day. I have nuts. Um, I don't really limit uh, the vegetables. Um, and again, that's very healthy for a bunch of my patients. But if you're trying to seal up a gut and you're trying to reverse that, uh, that gut leaking, um, the Paleolithic ketogenic diet is what we would put them on. Three weeks later, in the, in the lab of Sophia Clemens, they were able to see almost every marker was back to normal. Now, these patients started on a pretty good diet already, so in three weeks that they had almost normalized is an amazing improvement and super fast for these patients. Uh, in my clinic, I would tell that patient to stay on the Paleolithic ketogenic diet for probably six to nine months before adding any foods back, giving that gut a complete time to heal. Um, so here's another. They started on the standard American diet saying, Doc, I have this leaky gut. I have these problems. Three weeks later, again, that's a lot of shift from a standard American diet to a paleolithic ketogenic diet that will seem very restrictive to most of my patients. But when you're studying the evidence, look at how their gut does not allow those uh, particles to leak into our system and come out the urine uh, when studying, when they're on a paleolithic ketogenic diet.
All right, this person was went from paleo, and then they said, all right, I'm going to stay on a paleolithic ketogenic diet. This is the very advanced diet uh, for three years. And bam, look at that beautiful outcome. Their gut is no longer leaking. Look at how beautiful that looks. All right, here is somebody on a paleolithic ketogenic diet for two months, but they regularly consumed alcohol. And this is another thing that I get asked a lot of. If I have alcohol that is not uh, uh, that doesn't have any carbs in it, is that okay? And I would say, mm, depends on how sick you are. And if you want your junction within those epithelial cells on those enterocytes inside your intestine to heal, I would be cutting out alcohol as well. Uh, again, it changes the metabolism. It does cause swelling. It does cause those inflammatory markers to rise more than we want. And if you're trying to seal a leaky gut, alcohol is one of your enemies. All right, here we go. This is the one that I really wanted to point out. And again, tell uh, that, that team of Sophia Clemens how much you've helped some of my patients. This patient is a Crohn's disease 16-year-old, and I have these patients in my clinic. Um, maybe not quite that young, but I have been, uh, like this story, at the edge of they were ready to cut out part of this uh, young boy, 16 years old. They were ready to cut out his intestine. So the top one was four months of him being on this very advanced ketogenic diet. This is a paleolithic ketogenic diet. Uh, again, their Dr. Boz ratio numbers would be 40 or less all the time uh, when studying uh, their sy symptoms. And his, his body did do a dramatic improvement in those four months. Uh, when comparing this to what it was doing during before he had um, you know, the paleolithic ketogenic diet, uh, the, the numbers were so high, it, it, it looked like he doesn't have a gut. It just, there's no barrier to food and things coming in and out. And he was super sick. By 10 months on that paleolithic ketogenic diet, he has a normal seal to his system, a normal return of his bowel. Uh, of his bowel barriers. Uh, that is something that when I see severely advanced inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease, I used to think there was nothing we could do for them. Uh, that was until uh, I've seen the evidence found in the paleolithic ketogenic diet. Uh, here's just a better look at that wonderful story about this patient. Uh, again, uh, to, on the Octo uh, from 2013 to 2015, uh, they were doing everything possible to try and get this patient to, to reverse uh, that core disease, that inflamed bowel. Uh, the, paleo, or the, the medications they were using are all the same ones we use here in America. They are all trying to manipulate that immune system. They're kind of like chemotherapy or immune regulators. They even took the patient as far as giving them um, you know, a tube feeding. And I've had my Crohn's patients on this. They lose weight. They're very sick. Uh, they're very unhealthy. They can't keep the vitamins in. They can't keep the, um, the micronutrients like magnesium. Uh, they have so many malnourishment issues that that they are kind of ghostly before they die. It, it is awful. Um, and here's what they did. They stopped all of those medications. They did a very strict Katie, uh, um, ketogenic diet. And here is the 15-month follow-up. You can see that blue line saying from January 4th of 2015 to February 28th of 2016. And those were the times where they were able to grab the C-reactive protein and the uh, SED rate, uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Again, what those two markers are, are pretty bare bones inflammatory markers. Uh, we use them to monitor to see how well our, our drugs are doing. And when they get high, we know that it doesn't matter if the drug was supposed to help reduce inflammation, it's not working when the SED rates get really high, when that C-reactive protein gets really high. So on that ketogenic, um, a paleolithic ketogenic diet, not only did his um, uh, PEG 400 improve, but the SED rate and the C-reactive protein improved. But that's not the best part. Look what happened next. And this is the follow-up that she's done for 35 months. 35 months. And they looked at the inflammatory markers now as recently as January 2019 to say he has a normal SED rate. He has a normal C-reactive protein. It gives me goosebumps to know that I can offer something to my patients with this chronic inflammatory bowel disease. The most advanced, the sickest patients in my clinic are those people whose barriers of their gut, they don't just leak, they have holes in them. They have cells that have been programmed to die and slough off. They have all from their 
anus up all the way through to their esophagus, and it's awful. Uh, and this uh, is the first evidence, peer-reviewed, uh, studied patient that I've seen that has reversal of this process. She has several other examples in her clinic, but this one was something where she went through the process and published it, and I just can't thank that team enough for how many patients it's helped in my clinic. So um, I know I'm talking to ob -GYN, so this is the punchline. She had some pictures, and I used her actual slide to say, what kind of evidence do we have to say that people of childbearing age uh, that are pregnant or that are breastfeeding can use something like a paleolithic ketogenic diet? Um, they need to make sure they're eating organ meat, like liver. <laughs> That's something she stresses very important, is that organ meat is part of the paleolithic ketogenic diet. Um, bone broth bone broth made with chicken feet, which I've mentioned several times on this uh, channel, are really important. But what she was able to say about the women that she's studied on a paleolithic ketogenic diet, the most advanced ketogenic diet possible, was there was no extra weight gain for the mother. Uh, she was uh, did not have excessive vomiting during pregnancy. Uh, it was a much easier delivery, and they were able to restore their bodies after delivery faster. Uh, they did have smaller birth weight for the babies. So this is what makes uh, most ob -GYN people say, uh-oh, that's dangerous. But I would contend that the babies that came to these women whose inflammatory markers were better, whose guts did not have that barrier uh, of leaking happening, uh, were able to actually carry to term, or had uh, very healthy deliveries. And although it's this, a small number of people, I will keep an eye out for how this uh, progresses in the world of obstetrics and gynecology specific for the people that are going to watch this lecture in a few minutes here. So uh, this is my way of saying, reminding you, if you haven't uh, checked out the book any way you can, this is what I did for my mom. Uh, I taught her about the ketogenic diet. I did this by saying, guess what? Uh, this diet isn't just a fluke. It is something you can measure. It is something that's been around for a while and that has evidence base for repairing um, bodies and brains. Uh, the picture of my mom on the back cover of that book is what she looked like when I wrote the book. That was over two years ago. I would say she looks even younger now at 75 year, 74 years old than she has in 20 years. Well, that is the slide deck that I'm about to go down and deliver to the obstetrics and gynecology. Thank you for letting me share it with you, and I hope that you found it not just uh, evidence-based, but also that you learned that there are so many areas of the ketogenic diet that are more than just weight loss. It is about repairing the body and improving their body and their health one ketone at a time. I'm signing off, Dr. Vaz. Until next week, we'll talk to you then. Please subscribe to my channel. And if you want me to give you a ring, the next time I put out content, click that little bell.